Welcome to Talking Beat, the podcast for the Portland Police Bureau. We're focusing on thoughtful conversations that we hope will inform and provide you with a small glimpse of work performed by Portland police officers, as well as issues affecting public safety in our city. Here's what's on today's show. There's a pride in being a part of the Portland culture and the Portland environment, and that needs to be shown not just from the police officers, but from everyone. It has to be a collective pride that's seen and felt, not only to let the folks outside of our city know that we don't tolerate this and we won't have it, but to also let those who plan on doing these things that we don't condone this. It's not welcome. On this episode, we are talking about protests, demonstration, rallies, and marches. The Portland Police Bureau and the City of Portland have been in the news lately regarding large-scale events. Chief Daniel Atlaw is here today to provide some perspective on how these events affect the City of Portland and the Portland Police Bureau. Welcome, Chief. Thanks. Let's start with the current situation. Give us a better understanding of what is going on in Portland and how it's different than in the past. Uh, We're seeing an increase in planned and unplanned demonstrations or events um, that typically take place downtown. Uh, And with the weather nice, it's not surprising. Uh, But I think just given the amount of attention that our uh, protests and demonstrations have gotten over the last couple of years nationally and internationally, we're acting more like a magnet to these events as opposed to a, a deterrent. We're seeing a shift in the type of events that we're seeing. It would be really easy to say that when I first got here almost a couple of years ago that people came with the intent to tim- demonstrate against something um, or to protest against something or you know, be an advocate for. But now we're seeing an increase of planned brawls, planned fights, uh, where you have opposing sides coming together, meeting in the city of Portland in uh, specific areas for the sole purpose of fighting over ideological differences. And we know, uh, given the laws that we have here, that um, folks are bringing weapons, uh, whether openly or concealed, and they're doing this legally, which just adds an added layer of concern and a different element uh, to the tone of these events. And then, of course, you have social media, which allows, for instant awareness of what's going on, but it's not always showing of all sides. It's generally from one perspective or the other, and it's very easy to sway opinion in that way. What do you say to people who think that police protect one side or one ideological group over another? Um, You know, we facilitated, been available for a couple of hundred demonstrations and events, planned and unplanned, within the last year. And most of them, no one had even made a peep about, didn't even hear about. I say time and time again, we focus on behaviors and not sides. As police, we are to be neutral. We plan. There's a lot of planning that goes into these events, if we even have the luxury of knowing about these events. Of course, we don't want injuries, We want people to be able to come out and exercise their rights to uh, free speech without injury. All of that to say, we're not here to choose sides. After August 4th of last year, I received a lot of criticism. Um, I was called a race traitor and I was yelled at and asked, you know, what are little black girls going to think about what you did today? And it was because we used force against those who uh, said they were counter demonstrating against another group. And I told them, you know, we focus on behaviors. Granted, you know, there were some tactical things that we learned out of that whole day, but we spent the whole day keeping opposing sides separated, and it's the same thing that we did uh, with this most recent incident. And, you know, what happened was we, we can't be everywhere all the time, and unfortunately there were some injuries that came out of that. But again, we focus on behaviors. Um, It's not about choosing sides. We don't get to pick sides in law enforcement. It's just unfortunate now that we are being thrust in the middle of a political arena. And it's a very slippery slope, and I think it's really dangerous when you begin to politicize your local law enforcement that's supposed to be neutral. So, Chief, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about what is occurring here? So there are a lot of misconceptions that are floating around about our city, but then also about the Portland Police Bureau, that we just sit back and let illegal things happen. There's lawlessness, uh, that we don't enforce law and order, 
Um, I've even seen intimations that we don't know what we're doing, all of which couldn't be furthest from the truth. Our officers do an amazing job, very well trained. We've had the luxury, um, you know, whether you look at it as a good thing or a bad thing, but we've been fortunate enough to had to deal with so many of these events that we've had the opportunity to learn from things that we've done in the past that didn't necessarily work. In fact, we've been asked to travel not just all over the country, but even some internationally to speak or present on what we've learned here. We're just a living case study. So I think the other part is that people don't recognize um, that you can't compare apples to apples. Um, I've been asked, well, why isn't that you can't handle these events like New York does or how Boston or Chicago would do? You know, the obvious answer is we don't have the thousands of officers that those agencies do. We can't push a button and then have 1,200 designated officers solely to deal with a crowd management situation. So that's one piece. And I've mentioned before that the legislation here is far different than in other places that inhibits our ability to either, one, be strategic about how we go about these in a manner in which I'd like to be, uh, but also allow us to get ahead of these events before they even occur. And, you know, people have heard me mention the suggestion of an anti-mask ordinance or even um, something allowing us to record as these events are unfolding and occurring. Um, Other places are able to do that, and we aren't. The other portion... I think that's missed upon folks is that, you know, Portland is the biggest fish in the pond as far as we're the largest police agency or police department in the state, but we're a big fish in a small pond. Um, So when you look at Charlottesville, for example, um, when their local police department needed uh, mutual aid from the state troopers, the state troopers brought hundreds of police officers in a short period of time, along with the equipment and resources. Our state police here, I know, you know, the superintendent, he's an amazing guy. If he could offer hundreds of resources in, in as far as personnel goes, he would do it, but he doesn't have it. And then I'm also asked, well, how was your experience where you came from, you know, with your previous department? The difference there is that you're right next to San Francisco and Hayward and Berkeley and, you know, and neighboring agencies that are within 15 minutes or less, and they can provide a lot of resources in a short period of time. We don't have that advantage here. So we really rely upon our ability to work with the partners that do have the resources, but we're all so scattered and spread out throughout the state. Um, It becomes a bit of a challenge. So it's not comparing apples to apples. And then again, you know, the reality is, is, as we've seen, the political environment here is different. And that's important for us because when I ask for things like an anti-mask ordinance or a change in legislation that would allow for us to record uh, during these events, it's not as easy as flipping a switch and making that happen. There are laws in place that you know prohibit us from doing these things, and there's a lot of history behind that. So, Chief, the two biggest questions we get are, why can't you make more arrests? And why can't you just even stop this from happening before it starts? Why can't you keep all of these groups from coming downtown when their sole intent appears to be to brawl? I think those are fair questions. I think I'd even add a question to that. Well, why don't you just use the tools that you have? Why are you asking for more tools? Uh, You know, of course we want to make more arrests. With technology and, you know, the increase in the use of technology, you're getting real-time information now that we weren't able to get years ago. The problem with that is there's pros and cons, right? We're able to be far more transparent. We're able to keep people informed. But the flip side of that is is sometimes you'll only see a snippet of what's going on, depending on the perspective of whomever's capturing that recording. Um, Sometimes they'll show you what they want you to see, and sometimes they're able to grab it when they can grab it. So it might not be the entire incident or event from start to finish. The question often stems from, well, that person looked like, you know, they were assaulted. Yeah, it looks the same way to me, but without additional context or information, it's very difficult to answer right off the bat why an arrest wasn't made at that time. Now, we get some time to look into it, and we'll find that um, in a lot of these cases, an arrest wasn't made because we weren't there, but the person who had the video they did have the advantage of being there at that time. And then somehow that footage works its way to us and we're working backwards trying to put what happened together. And it's extremely difficult, especially in these protest uh, situations, to get people to come forward and provide a statement 
under penalty of perjury and saying that they'll testify in court. And then we talked about the masks, right? It's very difficult to identify folks, and they know this. That's why they do it. Um, Oftentimes, it's because we're not in a safe position tactically to do that. Uh, The way we train, and and honestly, it it depends on, you know, who the officer is, but most times you're not going to get an officer that on views a brawl that's going to run into a crowd of people that are engaged in a fight until they have enough officers with them to get in and out safely or to effect an arrest safely. Um, So there are a lot of factors that go into when we can or when we should make an arrest. Um, And I think just overall, uh, this is a question we get it a lot just answering day-to-day calls. This person did this to me. Um, The other person says they didn't do it. And we have to conduct an investigation. Just because we don't make a physical arrest today doesn't mean that we're not going to come back at some point later on to to make an arrest. So there are a lot of things um, that go into our considerations. But again, you know, resources are huge. We are concerned about flashpoints. I don't want to throw that out there too much, but it's a very real thing. Obviously, yes, we are trained to take on more risk and to put ourselves in danger, but we are also trained to be smart about it, and I expect my incident commander to utilize their resources in a smart way as well. We're not going to lead our resources, our our personnel, our staff, our people, our officers who are also human beings, which I think people forget, into an unsafe situation when we know that tactically there's a better way to go about in doing that. So that's why, um, specifically after the most recent event, we did everything we could in a very timely manner to push out photos or video or anything that we had to get um, people to come forward and hopefully um, helping us identify those who were involved in that. So the second part, we don't have a big gate that we can shut to close off the city. That would be illegal. <laughs> no, but there's there's no way to to physically stop people from traveling here. Of course, I would love to say, I'll say it now, if you know that a big fight is being planned on such and such date and time, don't show up. But that's not within anyone's right to be able to say that. People have a right to come and go as they please. And I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the police being a neutral entity, and that's part of that. We don't get to say who can and who cannot uh, traverse uh, in and out of the city. I mentioned earlier um, when people ask, it actually was maybe last November or so, Mayor Wheeler and I pushed really hard for a protest ordinance that would allow us to legally, on the front end, keep opposing groups separated when we know that there was a history of violence. So we didn't have to spend as much time and resources physically keeping these groups separated. If we could get ahead of the situation and control the environment up front, I believe that the likelihood of us us using force, even having to make arrests, um, would decrease. The ordinance didn't pass. And a lot of the questions, which were the same, that came out of that was, well, why don't you use the tools that you have? A tool belt is called a tool belt for a reason. It's not designed for one specific tool. We know that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to police response to these sorts of events. It depends on the tone. It depends on numbers. It depends on police resources. It depends on um, you know what's being discussed. It really depends on what you have, the climate. And a lot of the stuff you won't even know until you get there. And you have to be willing to go with the flow. And the more resources that we have available or contingencies that we have available to us, the better. The lesser amount of officers that we have as far as resources go, when we have a group that's already made it very clear that they're not going to listen to anything that we say, if we've already asked you very nicely or asked you at all to leave, and by the way, when you do leave, can you go this way and you have X amount of time to do it, If they've already made it very clear that they're not going to comply or honor our request, the only way we have to move people out of there is by force. The less amount of resources that you have to do that, the increased likelihood of us using force. Nobody wants to use force. Officers don't want to use force. We don't want injuries on either side. Why would we not work together to try to avoid that? The more numbers that you have, and we talk about New York and Chicago and you know larger cities, D.C., the likelihood of you using force is lessened because you have more people, more visibility, and, and more of a, an ability to get in between and keep folks separated. So 
again, it's not about having one tool or two tools. We want to have as many tools as possible so we can be as prepared as we possibly can for any scenario that presents itself to us. Of the tools you have, Chief, what do you think you're going to expand on or what are you focusing on for the future? The biggest thing, and I think this is going to happen, there has to be a shift of ownership. And I've said this before, you know, this is not a Wheeler outlaw thing. It's very easy to say, oh, this is a police matter. It's not a police matter. Of course, we're part of the solution, but this public safety is a citywide, I'd even argue a statewide matter of concern. And there has to be ownership by everyone. And the reason why that's important is because I think we all share the common level of being insulted or offended you know, by the reputation that our city is, is beginning to have as far as what we allow and what we tolerate. Um, this is a beautiful city. It's still a beautiful city, but there's still a pride here. I, I see it from people that are from here, people that have moved here and lived here forever since then. And even the new people, they came here for a reason. There's a pride in being a part of the Portland culture and the Portland environment. And that needs to be shown Um, not just from the police officers that work constantly, again, through holidays and days off and and do their absolute best each and every time they come and work one of these events, but from everyone. It has to be a collective pride that's seen and felt, not only to let the folks outside of our city know that we don't tolerate this and we won't have it, but to also let those who plan on doing these things, that we don't condone this. It's not welcome. Uh, And it's not just violence from any one side. It's criminal violence anywhere that takes place that, that we don't condone. So I think that's a huge shift that needs to take place, and I believe that it will. But we work really closely also with our partners, other local law enforcement, non law enforcement, to sit down at the table and say, okay, one, how does this impact each of us? But what can we each bring to the table to make sure that one, it's not just about messaging, right? Because I think it's annoying for anybody to hear something and it doesn't appear that that we follow through with it. But to show unity, not only in um, what we believe in in messaging, but to show unity in how we can work together and collaborate to keep our city safe. Chief, we've received a lot of messages, phone calls, emails, and you know, tweets, everything directed at us. How do you think this all affects the Portland Police Bureau and the members? We've been unjustly thrust in the middle of a political arena. And, you know, whether folks make these comments in general or they name someone specifically, these have impacts on everyone. There are been people that have received threats against their safety. But again, we cancel days off. We don't have the luxury of having a a reserve cadre of people that are, you know, just sitting around waiting for this to happen. We pull folks together. We provide them additional training on top of their regular jobs. And then we say, oh, you thought you were going to be off on this day. We need you to come in and we need you to handle this. It takes a toll. It takes a toll not on individual morale, but it takes a toll. It, it, it could wear down the organization if you let it. And I don't want to come off as a naysayer or an Eeyore or whatever because I don't want that to happen to the fine folks that work here. I want them to be reassured that I am affirming them in their abilities, their competence. They're some of the best officers that I've had the pleasure of working with and around The training, like I said, that we receive is top-notch and high quality, and I don't say that out of arrogance. I say it because we've had the advantage of learning uh, from previous incidences, and we know what works and what doesn't work. Highly qualified, highly educated, and again, because we have the advantage of constant repetition um, in doing these things, we know what we're doing. So there's expertise that's been gained across the board in this organization, and I don't want for one minute anyone to think that uh, because we're being thrust into this political show that I or the public have lost confidence in their ability to do what we do. I believe that um, the Portland Police Bureau shares the values of our community here. 
we believe in public safety. I believe that our community does as well. I want to reassure our community um, again that we have their best interests at heart uh, and that we are doing what we can to make sure that our city is safe for all of us. I would ask for their continued support. We've also gotten a lot of support. We've talked about the negative comments that we've received, but the flip side of that is that this is this has generated a lot of conversation. And, you know, I mentioned that a lot of these players are the same people, if not more, you know, from August 4th. And when I made comments about what took place there, it was almost as if people didn't really believe me that it occurred. Now, uh, because of technology and video, people are listening. And I would love for this new level of awareness to translate into uh, action and it has, uh, but I want it to keep. I want the momentum to keep going. Uh, there's a lot of genuine concern for the well-being of the safety of our city and the preservation of it. And I don't want it to get lost once the headlines fade away. I want us to continue to work together in partnership and collaboration. It's very inspiring, and uh, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about it, and we can continue to utilize this in energy in other areas as well. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to The Talking Bee. Do you have a question for us? You can call and leave us a message on our dedicated voicemail line at 971-339-8868. Or send us an email to talkingbeat at portlandoregon.gov. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends. More episodes can be found at our website, portlandoregon.gov slash police slash podcast. Oh,